ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئاتنا من يضل الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل الله فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي عمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي We begin in the name of Allah the most merciful the most graceful So in today's society we see people fading away from our religion the religion of Islam and this has been a promise in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wala asr in time Verily mankind will fall. He promises you that mankind will fall except Except for those who believe, uh, who have believed and done righteous deeds. And they advise each other to speak the truth. So you guys, this is not, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't make the promise for those uh, mankind won't fall, for those who have big beards, for those who dress up like uh, Alhamdulillah have dressed up today or many of you have dressed up today, for those who stay in the masjid for a long, long time. He said those people will be saved who seek the truth and they advise each other to be patient. Okay, so today uh, many, many American born Muslims, they don't know what it means to be a Muslim, right? So, if you ask any uh, non-Muslim, and he comes to you and asks you, hey man, well, wh what are, what are, what's, a, what's a Muslim? And how do you answer that? Uh, some uh, Muslims are not too religious, they'll say, you know, uh, we're, we're people, we worship uh, one God, his name is Allah, and you know, we believe in like, uh, the Prophet, there's some things I'm iffy about in our religion, and so on and so forth. And then the non-Muslim, he goes to a pious Muslim, he asks him, hey, what is a Muslim? The pious Muslim will tell him, hey, we, we pray five times a day, we always have to read Quran, all of these things, so on and so forth. But what happens when a non-Muslim asks the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He's our American idol, right? So we ask the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and when a non-Muslim approached the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he respond with? The non-Muslim said, Hey, uh, what is a Muslim? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he responded with, Hey, it's not a person, you know, who wears uh, long clothes, who always wears a topi, who has a big beard. Instead, he responded with, A Muslim is one who, do, who does not cause harm with his hands, nor does he cause harm with his mouth. This is not a literal meaning. What he means is, a Muslim does not physically cause harm, nor does he cause harm verbally. So, after seeing this, and after hearing this hadith, you guys are going to start to analyze the religion a lot more. Uh, you might be thinking, you know, why? Why did the Prophet ﷺ choose this way to define a Muslim? Why didn't he say a Muslim is someone who takes a shahada? Why didn't he say a Muslim is someone who take, uh, prays five times a day? Why did he use the phrase, a Muslim is someone who does not cause harm with his hands, nor does he cause harm with his mouth? That's what the Prophet ﷺ, our American idol, that's what he decided, uh, described a Muslim as being. One who does not cause harm with his hands, nor does he cause harm with his mouth. That is what a Muslim is. Then after you get that concept of a Muslim down, then you can go move on to the deen. Then you can take the shahada. Then you can practice the religion and further your iman. But for what a Muslim is, a Muslim is someone who does not cause harm with his hands, nor does he cause harm with his mouth. So... Uh, we look at the teachings of the Prophet and then we also we can go in the English dictionary if you go on Oxford dictionary and you check hey what is the definition of Islam the definition is only one word it says Islam is peace 
That's all it is. The way the Prophet ﷺ described a Muslim, the attributes he gave a Muslim, all revolves around peace. Islam is peace. Islam isn't uh, backbiting. Islam isn't, you know, doing interest. Islam isn't restraining yourself from worldly things. All it is, all that Islam is teaching you is peace. It's showing you the lifestyle of peace. So, after we do that, uh, there are many things you say, you know, there are many things that are forbidden for us, you know, and it has nothing to do with peace. A lot of things today are forbidden, and that's why a lot of uh, the youth, they restrain from Islam. A lot of people who convert, they restrain from Islam, because things like alcohol is haram, things like interest is haram, things like backbiting is haram, and all of these things are very, very hard to control. And so we go and we analyze these things, okay? We say, okay, let's see. Let's see why the Prophet ﷺ described a Muslim in this way and why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say something like, interest is haram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَمْحَكُ اللَّهُ الْرِبَى وَيُرْبِي sadaka." Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, I will destroy those who are involved with riba. Some people say you're in war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're involved with interest. But then also right after, in the same sentence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He will increase, for, uh, increase the, the risk for people who give charity. Same thing. So why, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say He'll destroy those? Why did He go to such measurements that He'll say He'll destroy those who are involved with interest? Uh, now this might scare a lot of people. They say, okay, then what? We can't buy houses. We can't live in America. You know, America is all about interest, right? You guys, have you noticed that we're trillions and trillions of dollars in debt right now? Why? Why? Because we are involved in interest. You go to any bank, they'll force you, hey, you know, open a credit card and, you know, you can pay your fees after so and so months. Just pay 0.001% interest, right? So why? 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 Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, you know, stay away from this? He said it because if you do research in economics, when any person is involved with interest, even the slightest bit, what he's doing is he's harming the whole community. He's bringing the value of the dollar down. He's bringing the value of the gold down. He's literally with his hands, he's harming the whole community. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala went to such extreme measures. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, hey, you guys restrain from uh, riba, restrain from uh, interest, or you'll be destroyed. Why? Because you're not only causing harm to one person, like the Prophet sallallahu said, do not cause harm to others with your hands nor your mouth. But instead, you're causing harm to a community of people. You're causing harm to the whole state. You're causing harm to all of America. Wherever you live, you're causing harm by being involved in interest. You're going, uh, you're going the opposite direction of what a Muslim should be doing. A Muslim should be giving charity. He should be helping the community. Instead, when you're involved in interest, what are you doing? You're destroying the community. The next thing uh, that's really popular is, you know, alcohol, drinking, gambling. Now people say, hey, why is this harm? How am I causing harm to anyone when I'm drinking alcohol? I'm only causing harm to myself. Okay, A, you shouldn't be causing harm to yourself. B, when you're intoxicated or when you gamble, you're causing harm to those around you. What happens when you're intoxicated? What happens when you drink alcohol? You lose control of your mind. You don't know if you're going to physically hurt someone. You don't know if you're going to talk behind someone's back. Right? You don't know these things. So. How, why, why would you do such a thing? This is not a definition of a Muslim. And what is the definition of a Muslim? For those of you who just walked in, a definition of a Muslim is one who, who does not cause harm with his hands, nor does he cause harm with his mouth. That is what a Muslim is. Not one who prays five times a day. Not one who does, uh, you know, uh, talks to girls. Not, no, these things don't qualify as a Muslim. Instead, these things make us a better human being. But what a Muslim is, the religion of peace, what a Muslim is, a follower of peace. He's one who, do, who does not cause harm with his hands, nor does he cause harm with his mouth. I cannot emphasize this enough. As soon as you learn this hadith, as soon as you get this narration down, then after you start analyzing things in the Quran, you'll notice that it all falls into place.
So when you drink alcohol, you're intoxicated, you're out of your mind, and you don't know what's going on, and you can cause harm to others around you. Now, uh, the last example I'll give you guys is a little more extreme, and this, we don't know what, when we do this, actually. We do this out of envy, we do this out of anger, and the last example is backbiting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says many, many times, do not backbite, do not cause harm to your brothers verbally, do not cause harm to your brothers verbally. So why? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say do not cause harm to your brothers verbally? Because if you go back to the hadith, the Prophet says, a Muslim is someone who, do, who does not cause harm to people, even with his hands, nor with his mouth. So when you're backbiting about someone, you're causing harm to them verbally. So backbiting is a major issue, that's why I'm going to emphasize on this a little more. It's hard to control. So many people ask me, hey Usman, how do you control backbiting? And I've fallen victim, a victim into backbiting many, many times. When I'm angry or when I'm jealous of someone, I will backbite about them and I cannot control it. So, uh, I'll tell you guys a story and then we'll start with the Quranic definitions. But the story begins with me being a little kid. So, when I was little, and I'm pretty sure all of you guys have experienced this one time in your life, I used to be very, very obnoxious. I would fight with everybody who would come in my way. I had this anger mentality for some reason, and for some reason I would just like to mess with people. I would like to mess around with them. If they caused me any harm, I would go bring them down in any way possible. I'll start cussing at them, or I'll start uh, telling people bad things about that person. But hey, this is not, this is not what a Muslim is, right? So how do you control backbiting? How, how can one control backbiting? So one day uh, I moved to Canada, and my parents put me in this Quran class. And this, this Quranic teacher, he was, he, was, uh, he was somewhat like my age. He was more modern, and he, he dealt with kids really uh, in a way that people could understand him. He didn't tell, hey, don't do this. He would say, he would give advice. So the advice he gave me, he said, hey, you know, you should restrain from backbiting. And I said, okay. And it's, it's hard for me to restrain from backbiting. And he told me, if you cannot restrain from backbiting, at least do this one thing. When someone uh, angers you, go home. Go home, and right before you go to sleep, tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this person has angered me. Then tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from, from the bottom of my heart, I forgive this person. Then tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please, you also forgive this person. So, one day I was in college, and one of these kids, one of my close friends now, he actually got on my nerves. He would always uh, bring me down, he would always say, hey, you know, you're not doing your work, you know, you're not that smart, what are you doing? And he always bring me down in any way possible. And this person, he was out there, he was president of many, many clubs, and he's always involved, he's always active, but his attributes were a little, uh, a little jerky. So I got really mad at this person one time. I got extremely mad at him and I couldn't wish anything worse for him. So what happened was I took the advice of my Quran teacher from long ago and I went home and I prayed to Allah. I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please forgive this person. He has angered me. He said so and so things for me, but please forgive him and I also forgive him. I promise you the next day, the very next day, the person comes up to me. He says, hey Usman, you know, I've been having a rough time and I took all my anger out on you. And I didn't mean anything I said. I realized it as soon as I got home. I actually consider you one of my close friends. And I don't know where I would be without you today. So the person's attribute just changed it. I didn't, I wanted to punch him. I wanted to uh, cuss him. I, I wanted to bring him down. But I didn't. Instead, I went home and I said, okay, you know, I won't cause harm with my mouth. Then you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in action. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put in that person's heart, hey, you know, this was a test and this person has forgiven you and I have also forgiven you and then he creates that bond between us. So once you get backbiting down, once you get alcoholism down, once you get interest, gambling, everything in the Quran you can analyze off of this one hadith which says, hey, do not cause harm with your hands or with your mouth. Also in Surah Al-Asr as I was saying, Inna l-insana 
So it starts with Wal Asr in time. Mankind will surely fall, except except for those who have believed and done righteous deeds. And except of those who have advised the truth and seek patience. So why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say advice? Because as soon as you meet these attributes, a math teacher cannot teach math if he doesn't know math. So as soon as you meet the attributes of being a modest Muslim, as soon as you meet the attributes of just being a Muslim, as soon as you meet the attributes of controlling your hands and controlling your mouth, then you can advise others, then you can teach others that, hey, you shouldn't be doing this. Because if you do do that and you're teaching others, then what are you? You're a hypocrite. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks really, really bad about hypocrites. So once we get the definition of a Muslim down, then we look at deen and dunya, which I'll start in the second part of the hadith, uh, of the khutbah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, so like I said before, a Muslim is one who does not cause harm with his hands or his mouth. Once you get the definition of a Muslim down, then you look at the diseases. There are various diseases in the religion of Islam. There's the disease of the brain, there's the disease of the mouth, there's the disease of the heart. So the first thing you want to do is you want to focus at the disease of the heart. Because as soon as people acquire this definition of a Muslim, then they're allowed to go towards deen, then they're allowed to move towards taqwa. So, uh, for this, I'm going to talk about attachment to the dunya, and how you do this is, let's say you're given a vessel, or let's say you're on a boat, okay? And this boat, this boat is your heart. What happens when there's holes in the boat? The boat starts to sink. So what happens when there's holes in your heart? Your heart starts to sink. Okay, so before we can uh, acquire deen, before we can acquire religion, many people complain, hey, you know, I, I, can't, I can't get myself to pray. I don't have that concentration. I can't, you know, I can't make zikr Allah. You know, I can't say subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, Allah, without actually meaning it. I can't focus on my religion. What's going on? We look at the shahada now. The shahada goes, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. What I want you guys to focus on is ilah. There's no ilah but Allah. What is ilah? There's nothing worthy of worship. Ilah is anything you worship. So every religion has a in ilah. Muslims, we have our ilah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you see Christians, their ilah is Jesus. And then you have atheists, their ilah is worldly things. Their ilah is science. That's what they worship. So, we focus on this word, ilah. If you want to empty your hearts, you want to start fresh from the religion, you have to empty your hearts, and you have to focus on this one word, which is ilah. What is your thing of worship? So, in today's society, especially with the youth, the youth love to play video games. The youth love to uh, watch TV. I actually did this halakha with someone, uh, with a group of uh, younger students, and I asked them, hey, you know, what, what is one thing that you cannot live without? And they come to me and one guy says, you know, I can't live without milk. Another guy comes to me, hey, I can't live without my parents. And another guy comes to me, he says, I can't live without my cell phone. Another guy says, I can't live without money. So all of these things have been mentioned, but truly what, what is our ilah? Our ilah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not milk, it's not cell phone, it's not money. Our ilah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we achieve that ilah? How do we empty our hearts? So after I asked these people, I said, okay, what if I was to take away your cell phone? What if I was to take away your, your wallet? What would happen to you? And we all came to a conclusion that you'd be in this trance. You, you would be shocked. You'd be, what just happened? This guy seriously just take away my things? That I cannot live without this. I cannot continue my life without this. But we forget. We forget what we actually worship. We forget the thing we cannot live without. We cannot live without Allah. As soon as we get that, then we can start cleaning our hearts. Then we can, while we're on our cell phone and we see an hour has passed, 
then we can start putting away our cell phone instead of saying, okay, we'll play for another hour. Uh, when we're drinking too much milk or we're enjoying too much fast food, we start controlling our habits. And all of these things are mentioned in the Quran. Control yourself, you know, folk balance between deen and dunya. So you have to achieve this balance. And the only way you can achieve this balance is by restraining just a little. So if you watch too much TV, just stop watching a little bit TV. Let's say you watch two shows. Instead of watching two shows, watch one show. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say in the Day of Judgment, He will say, was my religion really that hard for you? Was it really so hard for you to, become, uh, to restrain yourself from harming others with your hands or your mouth? Was it really that hard for you to pray five times a day and each prayer is only ten minutes? Was it really that hard for you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you, how will you respond with it? When, especially when your hands are talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially when your eyes are talking, and you cannot talk, you cannot lie. How will you respond to him? And with this, I will conclude my speech, and we'll move on to the dua. So, I ask Allah to save us from our corrupted mindset. I pray to Allah to open our hearts and increase our generosity. And I pray to Allah to give us qualities of a true believer and remove the qualities that deviate, deviate us from pleasing Him. Ameen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma ba'id bayni bayna khata'aya ya. Ya ma batil bayni mashriq illa maghrib. Allahumma naqni min al-khata'aya. Ya ma yinak fathaw bin abiyadu min al-danas. Allahumma aksil khata'aya ya bil ma'i wa s-salzi wa al-barad. اللهم إني زلمت نفسي زلما كثيرا ولا يغفر الذنوب إلا عنك فاغفر لي مغفرة من عندك وارحمني إنك عنت الغفور الرحيم ربنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي العاكرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار ربنا عذاب القبر ربنا عذاب الحشر ربنا عذاب النار سبحانك رب العزة عما يصرفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين